Um, so today, this week rather, uh, what I wanted to do, first of all, let me just say that I have um, uploaded information under your project on lumped elements. And this information, what in fact is probably extensive, I don't want you to read it, but uh, you can use it as a reference when you start it, when you start with the specific designs for your project. So far, we are preparing in this project um, to, we are preparing ourselves to be able to start the designs as soon as you select a receiver architecture. And so next week, you should be able to start thinking of your specific designs. Um, as you noticed, in homework, I gave you problems that will help you understand how to find the equivalent circuits or how to use the equivalent circuits of uh, very specific passives uh, to incorporate in your uh, matching networks. Because obviously, what is going to happen, um, as you probably saw from the most uh, recent uh, project tasks that I gave you, that uh, matching networks are extremely important to create an LNA, a low noise amplifier. So I told you before that a three-dimensional device is, can operate either as a low noise amplifier or as a high power amplifier of different types uh, because there are more than one, depending on how we, uh, where we operate them, so what kind of DC voltages we are using and how we match them. So unless you know how to do matching, you're not gonna be able to design an LNA to use in your project. And so, um, that is one, that's why we spend time reviewing matching circuits and transmission lines. The second thing is you do design something, but at the end, all of the elements you are using, whether there are sections of transmission line, whether you create an inductor like a spiral inductor that we uh, studied in the homework or whether you create a traditional MIM capacitor, which is the metal insulator metal. So like two metals and an insulator in between capacitor. Those, or whether you have a section of a transmission line for a stub, for example, they all have high frequency parasitics. Um, some of them have parasitics. You don't need to go that very high in frequency to find out that you have parasitics in those. And the equivalent circuits that I gave you show exactly what are your parasitics. They involve not only resistive elements, because obviously everything is lossy. Your metals are lossy. Um, they have finite conductivity. Your dielectric is lossy. It has um, some conductivity. And uh, from that point of view, uh, you're going to have your resistors. And then you're going to have also inductors. And why is that? Because you use physical dimensions that are not electrically zero. So as your frequency changes, then your uh, currents are flowing within uh, dim dimensions or distances that are non-zero, which means that they are introducing an inductance or inductances. So not only you're going to see the capacitance of the capacitor, but you're going to see parasitic inductance and you're going to see parasitic resistances, resistors. The same thing with the inductor. Um, the, you have metals that you are using, like a spiral inductor is a thin metal that is very long. I think her video just froze. Yep. I, I, yeah. Yeah. My video froze, but I see you very well. We hear you. Okay, we hear you again. Okay. I saw everybody very well so far. Um, okay. 
so if this is a problem, I had this problem before. If I still have it, I'll go directly to, and then you're not going to see me very much, but you're going to hear me. All right. I can just um, eliminate one and go to the other. In any case, the um, what I wanted to say is that Tell me if you don't hear me, just tell me so I can stop. Um, it's very important to know all of the parasitics because after you do your design, you will have to incorporate the parasitics to understand what is the problem that you are uh, having um, in terms of uh, those resistors. How much do they reduce your quality factor or how much do they increase your noise figure? All right, so you don't try to design for the parasitics, you just design it, assuming that you're going to have your like regular matching networks, all right, like uh, transmission lines. I mean, the way we do them with ideal transmission lines or inductors, or you're, if you use resistive elements, you want to use an inductor, for example, and then eventually you will have to um, use a you would have to practically use a spiral inductor and then in that case, you will just analyze of the parasitic impacts. The most important thing is to look at what happens to your noise figure or um, quality factor or bandwidth, all right? Usually if you look at noise figure that is directly related to your quality factor, we'll see later. If you look at bandwidth, of course, for filters, it directly relates to the performance of the filter. But um, we're going to look at the impact of the parasitics after you do your design, not before. So in any case, I show you those things uh, in uh, the homework. I gave you homework to be able to practice with that, with the analysis, please. And then also I put this reference into your project to be able to um, look at it when you start working in the project later or familiarize yourself. There are some interesting comments. You know, if you have time to read that, you're gonna only learn more, but I don't expect you to have this read for uh, the project now, only to look at the more information as you need it later. Now, beyond that, as we said, you need to know matching networks well, okay? To be able to do the, the receiver. Uh, we're gonna learn filters and mixers, obviously, but before we get there, we need to start talking about the active components that are, are the basis of an LNA, for example, is a transistor. Most of, most of the circuits will be transistors, unless you have a switch and you create a diode or something, or you use diodes for some other things. But assume that we're gonna only use transistors here. So I would like to give you an introduction to transistors. And of course, we have to start with di diodes. At this point, I would like to ask you um, how many of you have heard of diodes or transistors before? So uh, we learned this in the course of ESON 325, which is a compulsory course. Okay. We talk <clears throat> about, the, about diodes including like ideal model, direct. Okay, direct that's excellent. Model, Perfect. Oh, exponential model, Zener. And also we cover about BJT amplifiers. Okay, uh, excellent. So we can move fast um, in this process. And I did not know, you know, how many of you. So may I ask, since it seems that there are many of you had um, this um, material, is there anybody who did not have this material before? We don't hear you. You cannot hear me. Oh, I hear you now. Okay, I'll go, I'll move to the other one, don't worry. Okay. What I will do, I'll do something else. Let me see, without coming off this one. One second. Wait, wait. 
All right. How can you hear me now? We hear you now. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we'll use this one and I will um, turn this off. Okay, um, we're going to use this one now and I will share my screen. Okay, and I will investigate why I thought it, I have found the problem, but obviously I haven't. Maybe too many devices. Um, all right, so what I will have, what I would like to do today is to just review some things with you about diodes and then since you have already seen that at the end of this i will go into a discussion about um some of the uh, practical implementations when you go to layouts especially when you use microstrip and cbw and then i'm very pleased that you have done the mosfet um, because i have uploaded a note on mosfets for the uh, section today. And then we are gonna review this quickly on Wednesday. And then this week we are gonna be done with active devices. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, power amplifiers and how you match them. And then we're gonna move on. Now we are not gonna develop a power amplifier because we're doing a receiver. So all of the uh, amplifiers will be no low noise amplifiers, all right? That we're not going to have power amplifiers. So we're going to use the low, the, the small signal analysis for those. But in any case, so PN, uh, when you, uh, just a brief introduction to diodes, and these are my notes. Um, so in fact, um, what I would like to do is to also, well, when I need, I will write, since you know this stuff, so you have a, a PN junction. And um, if you remember, we have two types of um, currents that flow. We'll have diffusion. So, uh, and it's gonna happen automatically when you bring P and N, P type of materials, which has extra holes and N type that has extra electrons. You bring them together so naturally, because there is a difference in the levels, um, the energy levels between the P-type and the N-type, there is going to be a diffusion from both sides into the other. And then when it happens like that, and of course, if you apply now a voltage to this, uh, depending of course on the direction of the electric field, the electrons are going to follow the direction of the field so there's going to be a drift current that is going to force the electrons to go along from positive to negative all right obviously and then the holes to go the opposite direction and then there's going to be a whole drift uh, current and if you take the directions into account then that's how the total whole current is going to look and the total uh, electron current is going to look so Practically, we have, because of the PN junction, two types of uh, currents, and each one of them has two types of, one, of, of, of that. So we have the whole current, the current that comes from the movement of electrons. And as you know, when an electron goes in one, one direction, the current by convention is going to the opposite, all right? So we know that. We take as a current the direction of the holes, which are positive charges. And then, and so we have the, the electrons and the holes. And then for the holes, we have both uh, drift uh, current and diffusion. And then I call the, ex because of the external, the drift, I did not put two Ds in there, but for the drift, I used an E, means external uh, electric field that excites that drift um, phenomenon. And then we have the diffusion. And of course, the same thing for the, um, electrons and then we sum the two because even if the electrons and the holes go in opposite directions practically they sum up all right because the current that they we they are using are have the same direction okay now with forward bias um you see how i have the voltage here meaning that i put a plus 
on the whole side and I put a negative on the electron, what is happening? Um, there is just a, um, and if this is small, of course, forward bias and um, small, what this is going to create is, um, or forward bias and, and large, in fact, the forward bias, if it's positive there and negative, is going to, if it's very small, is going to create, in fact, I need to um, erase that because that is not necessarily helpful. I would say here, small bias. So practically, you have the positive on this side, the negative on this side, which is going to force the electrons to um, move in through the, um, to follow, to, go in, to try to go into the positive node, that they're going to force them to move through the interface and create, as a matter of fact, a depletion region. Now, why we call these capacitance the diffusion capacitance? Because it is diffusion. You diffuse from one um, type of material to another. So the electrons are going through the junction into the other region, and then they recombine with the hole, so they create a depletion region. And that's the diffusion capacitance. Now, there is therefore current because they are flowing through, all right? However, when you put a reverse bias, and then it can be small or it can be large, and the forward bias can be small or large, but in, if you put a reverse bias, then practically, if it's if also, if this is small, what is gonna create small voltages will only create, in the first case, small currents, because only a few of the, um, of the, electrons and the holes in the first case will go through the interface, but in the reverse bias, then the electric currents will flow away. I mean, the electrons will flow away from the interface and the holes the same. And so practically it creates a depletion region, which is much higher. And that creates, a, a, it introduces a, a lower depletion capacitance. So what that creates is the following. When you look at the voltage and then you look at the capacitance it creates, then the diffusion capacitance, which is practically creating a small and narrow depletion region, is going to be much higher and it's going to happen with forward voltages. And the depletion capacitance, which creates a much bigger region, is going to create, is going to be much lower all right, then it's gonna happen for all small voltages and for the reverse bias when you go to negative. So when you look at the total current that flows through this junction, primarily what do you see? You see that you have a strong nonlinear region and somewhere there you have the threshold voltage. And then you have an area where the current um, increases fast compared to the voltage. And now if you go very, very low, all right, then you have the breakdown and then you have the voltage breakdown and then you have down here, for example, if I were to go all the way there, you would see something like this. But now we are focusing primarily in this region. Um, and this is, uh, the right, we select an, a, an operating point. So here is what I wanna come to, um, of course, well, let me see, talking about that, but uh, we'll talk about this operating point in a moment and how That's we select it. Zener. Dr. Katehi? Yes. The lower one is called Zener. This one, yes, right. So um, the most, uh, um, from the PN junction, um, people now have developed, of course, many, many types of diodes, all right? And every time you, have a, you use a different uh, material system, you have ty different types of diodes that you design 
uh, depending on whether you want to um, use them for switching, fast switching, or to do other. side if you if you I isolate the silicon um, with a silicon oxide so you can have either a silicon based system where you have an intrinsic silicon wafer with high this has high resistivity and so you have high resistance so you cannot put your diode directly on that because you're going to have very high losses all right in your diode in the equivalent circuit as we will see next but then um but let me cut this for a moment but then uh, you are going to have um a to place an um insulating um substrate on top of the semi-insulate It's a good dielectric to put a diode on. But on silicon, you have to use a silicon oxide, which is a um, this one, which is a good insulator. In any case, um, so you see here the region that has, is doped, all right, and, and doped um, positively. This is a, a metal, um, and the metal also is selected accordingly. The plating is done accordingly. You have an ohmic contact. All of those have to be designed. And practically, when you create a um, diode like this, this is the equivalent circuit. And this equivalent circuit accounts for all kinds of losses that you may have, as well as the capacitance of the junction. So, um, your loss primarily is going to be due to the plating. This is your, um, your one end where you connect your practically voltages. So um, this is, uh, even when you do plating, even when you do it with gold, you're going to have uh, resistive losses in there. So you're going to get losses from the uh, contacts. You're going to get losses from the gate metal because it's going to be very thin and usually losses in the metals are connected to the, the skin depth in the metal how many of you remember the the um, definition of the skin depth i remember it a little bit okay what is uh, could you tell us a little bit of what the skin depth is so skin depth or skin effect Oh, they are related, but the skin effect. Tell me about the skin effect first. So if you have a conductor, you will have current flowing through that conductor. But yes. as the frequency increases, you that current migrates to be more and more on the skin of the conductor instead of permeating the conductor. Right. And how do we define that is good? And then how do we how do we get a sense of how much of this current distributes inside the conductor, because the more you have inside the conductor, the higher your losses, obviously, all right? So um, what, what parameter gives us a sense of how much inside the conductor this current distributes? The current density? It's the skin depth. So the current, for example, if I were to draw here, Add here, please. Okay, so if you have a conductor, here, this is a conductor. And then if there is an electric field, E and H here, then creates an electric field inside the conductor, all right? And then so what happens? If the conductor has a lot of free electrons, then those will just go, start moving. 
all right, in some direction. Let's assume that they move in this direction. And then that is gonna create an electric field that goes like this. All right, Jay. Now, if you look at this electric current, an electric field obviously is gonna, since there's gonna be electric current, then that is going to sustain an electric field inside. And this electric field is gonna look like that. All right, or the electric current is gonna go like this. It's gonna be much stronger near the surface. And it's gonna be much smaller uh, as it goes in. And then when we look at the distance between the top of the surface, and I believe here is one tenth, if I am right, if it goes down to be one tenth of the original value here, that is called the skin depth. And that is what measures how deep inside the material um, the current goes. And those are given. We don't have because people who have developed different metals have measured the DC and, in, and DC properties, obviously, and uh, also in high frequencies, and they know what the skin depth is. So they, it's given, all right? It's not gonna be something that you will have to calculate. So the skin depth is given. And because of that, then you have a resistance here, all right, in, inside, and therefore you, lo you lose uh, energy inside the metal. So instead of, um, the reason you lose energy is because primarily you have um, a lot of free electrons that move, but they scatter off, all right? They don't move freely. So, and that in, in gives you the, a, a resistance and a lot of times, um, of the metal, they may give that to you, or they call it sheet resistance. If you remember, we had that in one of these expressions. This is a sheet resistance, and it's practically something that people give. Um, there. It's And um, this is gonna account for all of the losses you have in this material. So also if somebody makes a, a Schalke diode that operates in some kind of a frequency that they will give you this. Even for us, we, we are not gonna solve for it. We are not gonna try to lay out a good Schalke diode or a good transistor, a MOSFET, but we are gonna get those equivalent circuits and then they're gonna be given. We're gonna get them and then we are gonna have all of the values that um, are important for these equivalent circuits. Now, uh, also something to remember that probably, that as you told me, you have already seen. So um, when we get a diode and we wanna operate with this, um, we have to identify the operating point, which is here shown as Q. And this operating point is established using a um, specific bias for the, this is as a matter of fact to tell you, um, this is not for a diode, this is a MOSFET. So that shows the drain versus the gate. Um, but it's, or a diode is a very similar thing. So even for that case, so why we are using them, why we are using these active devices, because the moment you establish your um, operating point through your biases, so you do a DC analysis of your circuit and you operate your point, your operating point for us is gonna be your design frequency, all right? In the receiver, your operating point 
it will have to be um, uh, specifically the one that you are going to have at your design frequency. And then you want to set your own. you would like this oscillation to take place in the linear region of this device so you at the time when you amplify because that's how the amplification happens all right your input comes here and then comes around your your dc voltage comes here around your dc voltage and then when it comes out is already amplified and that amplification of course is determined by the slope and by the operating point so you would like to have your operating point of the signal due to non-linear behavior. You would like to stay, therefore, within the linear region. And that is important in um, low noise amplifiers. So uh, that is a very brief, just intro, without knowing how much of this you guys knew and had a need of, um, I had prepared this for today to go next. Generations when it comes to passives or any um, matching components for the active devices. So um, with that, I would like to just pause for a second and ask. Can you repeat yourself? You kind of cut out. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, I'm just afraid that sometimes, you know, if I don't hear. Okay, so I guess all of this is familiar. That's good. So the next thing that I will do is to go and talk about um, those passives, which I wanted to do for you last time, and I did not have time to do that. Let me see. Um, I wanted to speak with you at this point Oops. and let me add about layouts you could choose. How many, uh, let me ask this question, how many of you feel comfortable with microstrip? Have you used microstrip before? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, how many, is there anybody who has not used microstrip in some form before? I haven't. Okay, so we'll cover we'll cover the specifics. Um, how many of you have you have have seen the CPW line, or they know something about it? I've uh, seen it, but I haven't like I haven't made any layouts with it. Okay. The what line? What line? I didn't, I didn't catch what you. Oh, CPW. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, no, I've not. I haven't. 
you have not seen it, right? Mostly the microstrip is uh, mostly used, but uh, CPW is what people are using also in high frequency applications. So I just wanted to show you um, how people modify or select their solution while they consider the um, layout, their layout. We're not going to do layout obviously for this receiver but i would like you to think how you're going to select your solutions depending of course on how you're going to select your fundamental geometry for your receiver all right um if you want to be uh, very adventurous as a adventurous as a designer then sometimes you Because in fabrication, it's very difficult if you go into the fab lines to have the equipment and the design tools to do both. Um, so it's more like a very specialized solutions that will do that. In any case, microstrip um, on the left here, as you see, has the ground. So if this is your substrate, The microstrip has the signal line here and the ground on the opposite sides of the substrate. Now, uh, why is that something to keep in mind? Because every time you need to short something, you will have to open what we call a via. And vias are very difficult to do in um, monolithic integrations because usually your gallium arsenide or silicon substrates are, have crystals, they have crystal planes. So um, when you try to etch them, um, so the way, for example, if I wanted to, let's assume that this is the end of a microstrip line. All right, I have this mic and, and this end here, I wanna connect it to the ground. For high frequency applications, the way I would do this is the following. I would take this substrate with a metal. I will etch it here. So it creates a groove, like a, a, a groove like this. And because the etching is gonna go along crystal planes, it's gonna more or less look like that. And then I will metallize this hole inside and like this. So it's gonna be metal here and there. And that's how you connect your signal line here with your uh, metal line. Now, all of this is okay. In fact, in CMOS applications, they, because they use multiple metals, all right, in the homework they gave you for the project, the CMOS not on, at the same place, but you may have to go um, like here from one, you go to another, and then again, you go up again, and so forth. All right, so and the dimensions are like at two and a half microns for CMOS applications. This is fine when you do it inside your CMOS. But if you are to do it for an RF front end, like you're close to the antenna, and this is your substrate, your substrate becomes um, a barrier because as your frequency goes high and your substrate, which is your like bulk substrate, it will be like, it could be like a low resistivity substrate at this point. Um, 
is, is, is high resistivity, excuse me, substrate at this point, is going to then start misbehaving when your frequencies become very high and your physical dimensions become very high with respect to the wavelength because high frequencies imply small wavelength. So in any case, so the vias for many considerations are a problem. High frequency applications are a problem, especially when you are outside of your transistor configuration and you are talking about the signal lines and how they take high frequencies, high frequency signals from one um, component of your receiver to another. Um, the other thing is, so on one end, high substrate thicknesses are a problem. On the other end, low substrate thicknesses are also a problem for the following reason. If I have a teeny substrate, let's assume that I use a silicon oxide on silicon, and then I put my ground here, or 3.6, 3.7 for silicon oxide, depending how you make it. Then to make a 50 ohm line, because most of the times you remember when we match one component of your receiver to another component of your receiver, then we use 50 ohm lines. That's gonna be our reference impedance. If you try then to design a 50 ohm line and you can do it either with approximate equations or you can go to MATLAB and do it, or another um, software if you have. Can ADS do that for you? Um, give a 50 ohm and give you a, the thickness of the substrate. Do they yeah, give yeah, ADS. You can Ohm. It will have to be of the order of a few microns to give you 50 ohm. Um, because otherwise, if it's much bigger than that, the capacitance from, do you remember how the characteristic impedance in a transmission line goes? is square root of L over C. So if your width W, it's much smaller than your thickness here, then your C is gonna be very high which means your Z naught is gonna be very low. So in this case, the characteristic impedance may be around 20 ohms. So when you start thinking about a 50 ohm impedance, practically you see that your W is gonna become of the order of a few microns. Okay, so that is one problem, all right? Why is that? Because a few microns here, because um, there are two things that happen in conductors. One is the skin depth, all right, the current that goes in here, the current that flows in here. And the other is the following, the current that flows on the surface, it goes like this. It's not constant on the microstrip. Have you, have you discussed that at all in the past? Has anybody told you that when you have a current that flows like this here, go Professor, you just cut out. Increases at the edges. It's not a flat, it's not evenly distributed, increases. And this here is called the edge effect. The edge effect. What happens when the current um, accumulates into corners, you lose a lot of energy, all right? Your losses become very high. So due to edge effects, you have high losses. So narrow lines, so narrow, W narrow, 
transmission lines have high conductor losses. So you have to balance too narrow of a W that gives you high conductor losses with too thick of a substrate that can give you a much broader W that gives you very high parasitic losses due to the dielectric. So in that case, um, you always try to find a reasonable substrate thickness, all right? So what you would need to do is to identify a substrate for your designs, for example. It could be like intrinsic silicon, high resistivity silicon, let's assume you use that. And um, you, will, you would rather select something which is around 100 microns in thickness for your high frequency trans transmission lines. That's where, not for your DC lines, for your high frequency, for your Narrow, two narrow lines are not very good for high frequencies. They are good for DC, not for high. But now, is to try to create a solution for an open end stub and one where it's rather a parallel connection. So parallel connection for microstrip for a stub, it's easy. The serious connection is difficult to make. I don't have it here. I would suggest only parallel shunt configurations for the stub and open end for your uh, selection of the um, matching circuit, all right? So, sun stabs and open ends. Now, in coplanar waveguide, it's easier to do this one. So you can do both open or short. See, that's the, uh, one of the advantages of the coplanar waveguide. And open is here. You see a, a shunt? Open, stab. Dr. Katehi? Yes. It's already 225. Now it's 226. I would like you to read these notes, which I have already incorporated. It says practical considerations for, and it's lecture notes, September 11. And this is what you can use as you are thinking about the design of your um, uh, practical transmission lines. Now, um, for the exercise, I will create an exercise for you. I have not created it yet. Um, I will create an exercise for you right now um, before the office hours, which will start at three. And I will open it up and you will have until 9 p.m. And um, in this one, I'm gonna just ask you some questions about the things that we discussed today if it's okay with you. It's gonna be only like easy, not uh, calculations, but uh, on the basis of concepts. Okay, so I'm going to um, open it right now in, a, in like, give me five minutes and I will have it done. Any questions before then? Uh, do you have solutions for homework two and three? Yes, and I will upload them as well as what I will do today is to put solutions for the uh, quizzes. And I have to do that. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Uh
uh, some of the some of the express some of the values depend on frequency. Yeah, because this is for the homework, isn't it? thought about homework number three with the given frequency because it seems that we don't really need it except for making the calculation of our sheet a little easier yeah so yes so let me see uh, courses uh, here this one homework Dr. Kapeni, would you also mind showing us what uh, Friday's answers were to the top hat quiz? Uh, are you speaking, Dr. Katehi? Yeah, we, we can't hear you. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you now. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So I looked at the homework. It says the following. It says, uh, it gives a capacitance, the equivalent circuit of ideal is simple capacitance. Okay, so it gives you this. And what uh, I want you... You're not screen sharing if you're... The... No, I'm not screen sharing okay. at this moment. I'm just saying, so it gives you um they so it gives you the equivalent circuit it says here however in the great capacity okay and it's the most complementary i call them i am all right for these capacitors there are three important parameters capacitor is a premium quality factor okay so we go here give that Um, using the above equations for the circuit components of the mif capacitors equivalent circuit Assume that the um, and then uh, 
So you need the frequency somewhere. That's where you are, you're descent telling me. Okay. Um, the problem is that then I, let me think about it. I assume that the circuit is reduced to the following form, calculate the omega and plot it as a function of frequency, considering the definition for Q plot omega. So find the resonant frequency after the resonant frequency. So practically, um, you cannot, um, I'm, I'm asking you in uh, section three to find the resonant frequency. And obviously that's where I'm interested, all right, in the resonant frequency. Um, then I think the best you can do for one is to calculate. So there you have a square root of F and where do, yeah, that's what I was talking about it's for the, yeah. the penetration depth. You have that square to F popping up. So I, I think what you need to do is to get that. Um, you can make some appro simple approximations, all right, for this if you want, or you can give the square root of F there. And then after you calculate, um, let me see. It goes uh, where rho is. So what you can do practically, you know, is um, assume that delta is very small and it's gonna be the e to the minus t1 is zero for a moment um, in the first. And then, so you have delta one and delta two, they still have delta, but it's there is the square root of f. So you get the square root of f out in front of r. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And you keep that there. You keep um, the square root of uh, f in the r. Okay. And then, um, that is going to help you to, uh, to address the first equation. And then when you go and find omega, then practically you plug in for that. Okay. When you find omega naught for the resonant frequency, then practically you plug in for that later. Okay. That, that's what I did, but I, I just wasn't sure if that's what you wanted to happen or if- Yeah, because yeah. I had in mind the resonant frequency and I know that, yeah. um, but I, I can also approximate when you do that, all right? I yeah. would approximate, yes. Yeah. So you get rid of those exponentials. Cool, I appreciate it. Sure. All right, thanks. Have a nice day, doctor. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kazendi, could you yes. ask what the responses were for, the, for Friday's top hat? Oh, yeah, I have not. Um, uh, let me check it out. I will, um, as I said, I will put all of the solutions today for the tap hat. Okay, thank you. Sure.